six, five, four, three, two, one. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to this episode of NASA and Silicon Valley Live for September 13th, 2018. I'm your host, Abby Tabor, and I have with me a new face today, my co-host. Hi, I'm Christina Chung, and if you didn't know, this is a NASA and Silicon Valley Live, a conversational show out of NASA Ames Research Center with the various scientists, researchers, engineers, and all-around very cool people at NASA where we talk about the nerdy news that you need to know about. Absolutely, yeah. And you can watch us live on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. But if you want to ask questions to our experts, who I'm going to introduce in a minute, you need to be on Twitch. So go to twitch.tv slash NASA. Watch us live, but if you miss us, you can watch us on demand later, including on NASA TV. And there's always the audio version if you want to hear the podcast version. So let's go. Today, we're going to be talking to you about studying life in space, as in what happens to Earth life when we bring it into the weird conditions of space. And later on in the show, we're going to share some genius space hacks that our researchers have come up with, really simple solutions to do this incredible research that they're getting done. So we're going to get to that later. But first, let me introduce you to our guest today. I have with me Sid Sun. Welcome. Sid is the manager of the Space Biosciences Division here at NASA Ames. And I have Sharmila Bhattacharya. Hey. She is a senior scientist here studying life in space. <laughs> Welcome, guys. Um, now, I'm going to be looking at the chat for questions from the audience, so while I'm browsing there, meanwhile, Christina, you want to get us into the science today? And Sure, definitely. Alrighty, so uh, welcome, Sid and Sharmila. Thank you for um, coming here. And um, just to get, the, um, get all of us um, situated, uh, what is space biosciences, and why is this important that NASA does space biosciences research? Yeah, so we are studying life in space. We're looking at all different types of organisms, mm -hmm. Uh, ranging from tiny little microbes, uh, tissue cells, fruit flies, other types of animals. Uh, and the reason we're looking at all these is that we want to understand uh, the risks that are facing our astronauts as we go on to Mars. Mars itself is going to be roughly a two or three year round trip mission for astronauts. Uh, there's going to be a lot of risks that they're going to be facing. Uh, there's a high radiation environment that they're going to be exposed to. Uh, they're going to be experiencing zero gravity as they're getting to Mars. When they get onto Mars, they'll mm -hmm. be dealing with roughly a one-third uh, gravity environment rough, relative to what we experience here on Earth. Oh, wow. And then, of course, then they have the long trip back. Uh, so there's a lot of changes they're going to be experiencing, and there's a lot of things that it's going to be hard to study on the astronauts themselves. So we do our studies with uh, mice, fruit flies, and other organisms. Oh, very cool. Sharmila, do you want to um, maybe expand on that a little bit? Yeah, so I was going to say that, you know, um, some of this, as, as we just uh, uh, talked about earlier, that you want to know uh, what happens in the humans or in astronauts, but it's very hard to do these experiments on humans. And so you need these little surrogates, so to speak, you know, these tiny organisms. So you actually understand the basic biological changes that are happening inside the cell so that you can then send, you know, with your crew that's going out there into Mars or moon explorations, you can send them with, you know, the medications they need, mm -hmm. some of the countermeasures, and to know what to send and, and how to keep them healthy out there, you need to understand the basic biology um, underlying these changes. And that's what space biosciences is about. Yeah, amazing. I already have a question. You, you can tell me if you think we're going to answer this throughout the show. But um, Rev Lucky Shot wants to know, what's the biggest difficulty in performing these tests in space? Ah, very good question. So I, t for me, I think the biggest issue is the fact that you're limited in mass and volume. Uh, so the oh. size of your experiment has to be, and you don't need, you can't uh, expect very much help from the crew because they're busy doing other more important things uh, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah, right. And so you have to have it often be automated, it has to be small, and yet you're going to have to ask those important science questions 
and you want to make sure that when the experiment comes back you can answer them so so designing that experiment so that it's successful useful but also fits within the constraints of space flight are the challenge mm -hmm. i think Oh, well, speaking of things that we need to send into space, um, I think we're going to move on to a Let's Play. Um, our first segment. Yes, yeah. our first segment, yeah. Let's Play. And we will be um, answering the question, has it been to space? Yeah. You want to roll that Bring segment, Bill? <laughs> Get us ready. There we go. All right, guys. This is a game. I have some questions for you, and you guys watching can play along at home. And if you get, let's say, 10 out of 10 of my questions, we'll give you a shout out. So, <laughs> no has, <prize>? that's a <laughs> prize. Uh, that's right. a prize. I know. I mean, <laughs> shout out from NASA. I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. So the okay. question is, has it been to space? And I have for you 10 organisms. All right. The bear. Uh, no. no, definitely not. No, no. definitely not. <laughs> Surely not. <laughs> All right. No polar bears, no, no polar brown bear. bears, no black bears. <laughs> All right. What about the jellyfish? Jellyfish. Yes, we have flown jellyfish. For real? Yeah. Why would you fly jellyfish? Exactly. Why? <laughs> yeah, well, it turns out uh, jellyfish have these tiny little organs that help them sense the gravity oh. field that they're within. And so we wanted to understand what happens when they're in an environment without gravity. Fascinating. Yeah. That's cool to me that an ocean creature has that kind of. Was it dangerous to set? I mean, I'm scared of a jellyfish sting. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right. I'm just saying. You you know, that stay just away from like, those stingers. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but that's where it's nice that it's all contained. That's true. True, true, true. Very true. In their tanks. All right. Ready. Rodents. Yeah, definitely. Most, yeah. In fact, <laughs> that's uh, one of the organisms we fly the most oh, yeah. to do our experiments with. Uh huh. Yeah. Here at Ames, even, right? All right. Here's an odd one. Sorry, can you see <laughs> it? I, I think on the screen or I can show you guys? That is an odd one. It's a squid! It's, it's a squid. squid. <laughs> yes. Yes, we have done yeah. experiments really? with squids. So another ocean critter we've actually sent into yeah. space. Yes. Squid, though. No, not giant squids. At no. least. Oh, no, no, no. I was, was going to say we what type of squid. Tiny little squids. Do you know why? Um, well, well it was an interesting experiment because uh, these tiny squids, as they were growing from their baby stage, essentially, they were going through some changes in their body. And uh, we wanted to understand those changes would be different in the environment that they're experiencing in space. Oh, yeah. Growing and developing and yeah. how space changes that, yeah. Cool. What about? No. <laughs> no eagles. The eagle, no. Our nation's favorite bird, That's right? right. <laughs> he didn't get a chance to go? Oh. No. That seems unfair. Too big. <laughs> yeah. All right. Those flying creatures know. What about? Yes. The fruit fly. The fruit fly, definitely. Yes. 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 <laughs> Sharmila and I both are kind of cheering yeah. right now. Yes. Yes. Definitely our favorite. Your favorite <laughs> organisms? Yes. yes, indeed. Okay, here's one of my favorites. Spider, yes. 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 Arachnids. Also Arachnids. Yes. Have gone to space. Have gone to space. For and science. And uh, you know that I think we were talking about it, but what was so cool is that the spider made a web and it wasn't quite right. They took it down, built another one, and it was perfect the second time. So you're so saying the learned. spider learned. Yep. That's yeah. That fast. It did Pretty it once, cool. it was messed up. Yeah. It built its web. And again. it knew that it was messed up, took yeah. it down and knew how to adjust and make it right the second time. Pretty That's cool, amazing. right? That's very cool. <laughs> There's a question. Smart critters. Yeah. So many ocean creatures <laughs> have gone to space. Why so many? Is there a specific reason you'd choose marine animals? Um, there are different type of organisms, model organisms that we, there's a wide range of them and just, I think just from your quiz there, yeah. <laughs> you, you picked the marine ones, but yeah, we've... Oh, maybe so. Yeah, we might <laughs> have been a little bit biased on those. Yeah. Yeah. California <laughs> coastline. Exactly. <laughs> we love the ocean. A couple of people are asking about the birds. Okay, there's been no eagle, but have there been other birds? Huh. And so they want to know and how would they learn... eggs, right? Yeah, so yeah. we've found yeah. different eggs in space and seen how they've developed. Um, I believe there's been some birds flown, but I'm not too familiar with the science themselves. Yeah. So, so with that. Yeah, and they've been flying things like there've been uh, bumblebees. 
Oh. And insects that oh. fly. Can they? Uh, do they fly? Or do they succeed? In they do. Flying? The bumblebee, from what I remember, there was a lot of tumbling. So they, uh -huh. they mm. clearly uh, knew that that gravity was different. Was different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. And they figured so, it out eventually. Interesting. Very cool. Here's another ocean creature. Oh. No. The lobster. Mm, yeah. <laughs> no? Tasty. Uh, yeah, it's not a delicious <laughs> one. Yeah. <laughs> not even for the astronauts' meals. <laughs> what about this guy? Ah, what is this guy? Is this? Oh, <laughs> is it the gecko oh, newt? Oh, yeah, that's it's a, a newt. newt. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. No, I, we've done some interesting experiments with newts because yeah. uh, we want to see how what happens with the tail as it grows in space because there's uh, a lot of. Um, uh, tissue generation processes yeah, associated right. with it. And uh, one of the interesting things we found out was uh, newts grown on Earth, their tails have a downward bend mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. But this, the newts growing in space, because there's no gravity, the tails are perfectly symmetric and grow out horizontally oh, yeah. relative right. to the animal. And would you study something like that to understand how the human body could generate tissue? Yeah. Is that, is that the connection? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there, there are these. Uh, so, so the way the cells actually divide are very similar between all different organisms. And so, uh, newts and you know with stem cells and so on. There's a lot of applicability to. Yeah, a lot of similarities. Yeah. Okay. I have one more. Ooh. All right. Now, think hard. What about this guy? Right. Your favorite. This is the narwhal. <laughs> No. I can imagine yeah. there'd be a lot of issues. Yes, with, fitting with, that. Right, fitting it, perhaps. Maybe, maybe that, maybe that, the, 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 yeah, yeah. 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 Some <laughs> certain complexities <laughs> just sending a narwhal to space. We did do a Twitter poll on this subject over the last couple of days, and it oh. seems that our followers nailed it. The narwhal <laughs> has not been to space. Okay. Uh, not <laughs> yet, not yet. You guys were right, so well done. <laughs> all right, that's all I got for you. So why the great diversity of organisms? Can you just kind of sum that up for us? Yeah, so uh, the different organisms have uh, are studied in different ways. Uh, you know, one uh, organism that I could talk to are the rodents mm -hmm. that we fly in space. A lot of the mice and rats uh, that we uh, have in space are, are used for different types of experiments. Uh, a number of them are involving bone and muscle research. Oh, yeah. And so uh, we've had uh, experiments on space station where you want to examine what happens over a course of time uh, with the bone that the, are in the mice. Uh, so what we have here is a model of a mouse femur or the hip bone. And uh, no, this is not the actual size of <laughs> right. the oh, mouse. Gosh. Although I, I do tease kids when I show them this. I, I tell them That'd that we're giant, flying giant mice on space station and their eyes pop <laughs> open. Like, oh, no. Um, yes, giant but mice. no, this is a, a 3D model. The actual bone is much smaller. It's, it's smaller than a, uh, it's just a fraction of an inch long. Uh, but uh, the bone loss is significant in space and the bone loss we see in mice is much faster than what we see uh, with humans. So mm -hmm. typically the, the bone loss an animal experiences within one month is equal to what an astronaut would experience across a whole year. Right. So we could see results much faster. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, not only are we at NASA interested in this phenomenon because we're curious about what's happening with the astronauts, but uh, it's also uh, drug companies who are looking to deal with, uh, to come up with treatments for osteoporosis, uh -huh. uh, very significant disease affecting many, many people. Right. Uh, so, uh, uh, we're working with companies like Novartis or Amgen or Eli Lilly uh, to develop, develop new treatments. And uh, one, one example of uh, what we're seeing is um, this is an example of what bone would normally look like. Okay. Uh, and you yeah. can see this is the inside can, of the bone. Can you guys see that with the camera? And... Uh, normally, the inside of the bone does have this cheese-like structure, but uh, Swiss there's cheese. small pores in yeah. here and a lot of a lot of blue structure. Okay, it's yeah. just colored this way to, to illustrate it. Uh, but the mouse bone, I was saying, in space after 30 days, they experience significant loss, and this is what we see after 30 days. So you'll see oh, much right larger holes. Yeah, right in the middle. Yeah. 
And so with less structure, more holes, that's definitely telling us that the bones are far weaker. Okay, right. Uh, and so we're worried about this. You know, what's going to happen when the astronauts uh, have to do work, perhaps when they land on Mars, and if they're going to have weaker bones, it's going to be they're much more prone to injuries. And such. Right, right. And you need to figure that out now, right, right. before they arrive. Uh, there's a question that might be related to this. What's the most notable breakthrough in the medical field that has been found through space experimentation? Is that a good example? Yeah, yeah, exactly. We're we're working with companies all the time to understand how this is playing out. Uh, so, and then we're doing experiments in cell biology, immunology, studying how to prevent uh, people from getting infections. Uh, so, there's a wide range of different diseases that we're we're examining. Cool, man. Do you want to talk more about some of the other experiments that Ames has sent to space? I know rodent research is one of them. Right. Do you want to? Yeah, definitely. Talk some of the others. Um, so, Sharmila, I know you are one of our resident uh, fruit fly experts here. So do you think you can tell us a little bit about the fruit fly research that's done at NASA Ames Research Center? Yeah, certainly. I'd love to. So here you can see this vial here is um, you know contains these fruit flies. You can see them. You know you probably have seen them in the house, <laughs> buzzing around your rotting bananas. Um, and they're tiny, but they're extremely useful. And so fruit flies, for example, are used on Earth to understand various disease conditions, along with, you know, how does your immune system work? So when you get infected by a microbe, a bug, mm -hmm. you know, and you, you do feel better in a day or so, you know, how does that happen? How does your body cope? Um, so the fruit fly actually has an innate immune system that's very similar to humans. So we learn a lot about, you know, immune system, the brain, you know, how does the brain respond in a new situation? And, you know, being in space is definitely a new situation for most organisms. Mm -hmm. You say a fruit fly has a brain. It has a brain. That's incredible. Like, are we talking like, I mean, it's got to be small. I mean, microscopic, yes, oh, but. Wow. Was surprisingly very um, structurally very similar, you know, in the okay. way the neurons function and stuff. Wow. Is actually very similar to the, there are many fewer neurons, there are fewer right. cells. Right. So it's simpler, which also makes it easier to study because then you actually, you know, can, can look at changes in the brain and changes in the behavior in new situations and start to draw correlations as to, you know, which genes are important, which part of the brain is important. Wow. So similarly, you know, the heart is another important, mm -hmm. you know, organ system. Mm -hmm. There's several of these, you know, the circadian uh, system, which means, you know, oh, your night and day, yeah. the night and day. Sleeping. So yeah. when you have jet lag and, oh, or, or you have you been know, there. <laughs> stayed up all night with an all nighter, you know, your, your sleep is thrown right. off. And, you can study that in flies. And you can study that in flies. That in fact, crazy. the Nobel Prize actually oh, uh, right. recently w went yes. to a Drosophila researcher who worked that all out in fruit oh, cool. flies and it's very applicable those same genes or many of those genes and pathways are very applicable to humans and that's how we know a lot about what happens in mammalian systems along with studies and other yeah. models after that but but a but lot of this work was started with the right. fly. Cool. Wow. Did you tell me that your students develop that hardware? Yes, yes. So I was just going <laughs> to so say cool. that you know the other major advantage of doing something like fruit flies in addition to its similarity to, to the humans, is that you can fit thousands <laughs> of these flies into a one box this size, which was developed, in fact, in my lab by summer students. Oh, cool. And, wow. and then NASA, you know, helped kind of ruggedize it and make it okay. a little bit more robust. But otherwise, essentially, the design is that made by students. And so we Amazing. can bring back thousands of flies in a box this small. And you can just you know you can really study and understand a lot of very valuable systems that you yeah. couldn't do in humans or in a larger organism like you said the eagle where you cannot <laughs> right. can't really fit, right. you can't really really. fit too many eagles in there yeah <laughs> wow yeah. speaking of you know hardware developed here at Ames I know there's also a piece of hardware up here um, developed um, by Ames researchers as well is that right yeah so what we have here is the uh, it's a cassette from the bioculture system, mm -hmm. and this is a system we developed at Ames to grow cells in space. Uh, what uh, we have down at the bottom in, in pink and blue is the bioreactor, and that's where the cells actually grow. Um, and to keep the cells alive, we have fluids that are circulating. And the fluids provide the nutrients, the gases okay. to, to supply the, the cells and also carry away the waste products. Wow, it looks like a really complex system. Oh, it is, exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then um, 
We have uh, 10 cassettes, 10 copies of these that are in uh, what's called the bioculture system. So by having 10 of these, we're able to examine uh, multiple samples or different samples of whatever, whatever uh, cells we're wanting to grow. So cool. Uh, I'm going to keep us moving because we're, <laughs> we're running short on time and we have so much more that we want to ask. And I have a bunch of questions that I'm going to save for in just a minute. Um, this stuff is all things you've developed fairly recently and you're using now. What's next? Is there, do you want to talk about the satellites? Right. Um, so, actually, Sharmila, you're also the principal investigator for another very interesting experiment called the BioSentinel. Wow, that's such a cool name. I mean, anything with the word sentinel in it, I think it's really yeah. cool. You yeah. brought it, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> did, we, did, did you grab the satellite oh, yeah. Yeah. for us? Yeah. Let's, let's bring it up it's here. Room here. Oh, yes. So, bio sentinel. And while, while Sid is helping bring the uh, model over so you can see what the satellite looks like, let me show you what the yeast cells look like. So these are yeast cells, not dissimilar at all to the yeast that you have that help make bread or beer. Uh, those of you only above 21 would know what I mean by beer, but <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> but so what you're seeing here, for example, each of these uh, spots is actually hundreds and thousands of yeast cells. Each, in fact, one, each of these colonies was founded by one single cell. So remember how I talked talk to you about fruit flies and an advantage being numbers? Well, similarly, there I could fly thousands of flies in a box that big. Here I can, I can fly millions and billions of cells in a satellite this size. And why is number important? Because you know you need those numbers to do statistics in science so that when you see a change, you know it's believable and reproducible. So you need a large number, right? So what are we doing with these yeast in the satellite and why is it interesting? Well, for one thing, um, remember, uh, Sid mentioned that when you go uh, deep into space, there's more radiation, right? And so we want to understand what that radiation would do to biology. What would happen to an astronaut who is going to Mars and coming back? Um, and so we use these yeast cells who actually, or which, the, the yeast cells, have DNA repair mechanisms very similar to humans. That's amazing. So when the radiation actually damages DNA, for example, in the yeast cell, and, and then it's repaired, we can actually learn a lot about that repair mechanism using yeast cells. That's so crazy how all of life uses the same things. Exactly, from a, a right? tiny cell this yeah. size to the fly, to the, you know, to the eagle, to the whale. Right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're, we're all, you know, made up of very similar um, building blocks. Right. All these cells are going to go in that satellite, right? It's going to go in the satellite. And, and where is the satellite going to go? Yeah. That's right. Good <laughs> question. Very good question. It's actually going to go very, very far. It's going to go towards the sun. And it's going to, in six months, it'll be about a third of the way to the sun, oh, wow. which is approximately 30 million miles wow. from the Earth's surface. That's a lot. Long ways. It's a that long yeast way. Is going. <laughs> that yeast is going very, very yeast, far. Yeah, very brave, daring yeast. Uh, <laughs> and we learn a lot from them about how the DNA will respond in this radiation environment, how it will, um, uh, you know, survive, and and so on. And so we'll use it as a biosensor to understand the effects of deep space. And we'll have uh, something called a, an LET spectrometer, which is also a dosimeter, which will also measure the radiation. Oh, okay. So there'll be the oh. biological effect and an actual physical measurement, mm -hmm. which we will compare. So I why see. is there so much radiation, you know, outside of, you know, that far into space? You know, do you think you can kind of yeah, expand on that? Absolutely. So so we on Earth are, are lucky in, in a way, and um, uh, many, many planets have this thing of where we have a magnetic uh, field mm -hmm. that protects us. It's called the Van Allen Belt. Okay. Oh, very and cool. there you it is now. See it's a, kind of like a donut. <laughs> That's right. You see lie. a visual <laughs> over there of that. And essentially, this uh, protective shell protects us from these highly energetic, highly damaging particles that would come at us either from the sun or from the cosmic uh, radiation um, yeah. and which could damage our DNA which could damage you know our our cell membrane etc you know different parts of, of, of our body uh, but we're protected uh, on Earth's surface but then when you go to Mars or moon mm -hmm. you're going beyond this protective sphere um, and that's why you know and before we send humans for very long duration missions right. you want to send these these sentinels um, oh. as sensors <laughs> or just <laughs> hence the name hence the name Bio Bio 
fentanyl. Right, exactly. right. Exactly. Would you say that all this biosciences research is kind of ultimately leading up to sending humans farther into space? Is that the, the final goal? Yeah, that def definitely. for space biosciences, is that's definitely um, so a very first to important. The moon, and then Mars, and then yeah. beyond. That's right. right. Oh wow. That's right. So we've, we've got to move on to our next segment. And last with you guys, we're going to do a rapid fire. So if okay. Bill can <laughs> throw our animation up there, we'll get started. This is a segment where we ask you a whole bunch of questions. I'm going to fire a bunch of questions at you, and you answer as many as you can in the next minute or so, because then we have to move on to our next guests. Okay, so there are a bunch from our viewers. Uh, what is your favorite experiment that has been done in space? Question from Colin L. Hmm. And or, well, that's Colin's question. My question was going to be, if you could do some, a new experiment, what would it be? Wow. Okay, these are all excellent. <laughs> um, I would say my favorite experiment in space was... Um, when we flew fruit flies for the for um, we you know it hadn't been flown for a number of years and then we flew it to look at how the immune system changes and how it responds to an infection when they come back from space um, and these fruit flies you know the experiment was really successful came back we did the experiment and we found some really cool things about how the immune system was perturbed by space flight um, and found actually that they were uh, perturbed in ways that were uh, quite similar to the way they are affected in humans and I thought well, that was very cool because we we learned quite a bit about the basics of what happens that's cool cells. here's another one uh, from vanilla man 47 besides bone structure damage how does space affect our body Oh, yeah, lots of different changes, <laughs> our cardiovascular changes, uh, immune system changes. Our uh, vision changes as well, yes. if I remember correctly. Yeah, that was interesting because that arose only when the astronauts were in space for three months and longer. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and so those are the big, the, the gross anatomical changes, as we were just saying. But then even at the deeper level, at the cell level now, you know, we're, we're, people are, scientists are beginning to do a lot more molecular biology, and we're finding some pretty cool uh, changes even at the subcellular level, so different organelles inside the cell and how they function and how your genes make uh, proteins, um, RNA and proteins, those are all affected. By so those are all life. changing. Those are all changing in tiny ways, so mm -hmm. that you know right. uh, you can still survive and and do your job. But at the same time, there are enough changes that you need to understand it, so you know how to handle it for long duration right. over right. time. Space. What's that you wouldn't do want to send yeah. our astronauts over blind. Yeah. You know, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Nova Static wants to know: Do you expect experiments to be done in orbit around the moon? Yes. Oh, yeah, very much. For sure. Yeah. 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 Well, there's uh, NASA's envisioning something called uh, Gateway, um, which could be a facility that will uh, support uh, experiments in space. So we've been uh, starting to define what kind of research we'd like to do there. Mm -hmm. Wow. Very cool. Exactly. And got a lot to look forward to. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, maybe one more quick one before we have to say goodbye. Um, do the astronauts have any involvement with any of these space station animal experiments, or are they run autonomously from Jericho? Oh, no. Astronauts <laughs> actually are big. They are partners in this. You know, uh, For example, the fruit fly mission that uh, Christina and I ran recently, mm -hmm. um, we had to have astronauts actually give the flies new food. They took the samples. They fixed it in preservative and froze them so that when they came back down, yeah. we could analyze the molecular biology of the changes. Yeah, they were like our hands yeah. up there, and yeah. we owe so much to them and yes. all their hard work yes. up there that on the station. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And that's for the ISS, but then when you do a satellite mission, yeah. like we talked about by Sentinel, then it's completely that's autonomous. That's autonomous all by itself, performing it its which So is we've important. done yeah. both, but mm -hmm. it's a, just two different ways of doing science, both yeah. very useful. Yeah. But very right. useful. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I wish we could keep you for the whole hour, but we have more people to meet. So thank you so much for coming on. Thank Thanks, you. both of you, for of having that us. That was fun. Thank you. All right. And for those of you watching, quick reminder, today we're talking about studying life in space and what kind of tools do we need to do that and what kind of questions can we answer. Um, if you have questions, please leave them on twitch.tv slash NASA. 
They are clearing out all the hardware that you got to see in the first half, and we're bringing in a couple more researchers who are going to talk to us about the space hacks, genius hacks that they've developed in their labs to get research done either here on Earth or up on the space station. It doesn't always require some super specialized fancy equipment, and they're going to show us all about that coming up. All right. So, hello, hello. Welcome, hello. guys. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so now we've got to re-meet our crew here. And actually, I thought we should start with you, Christina, because you're our host for the day, but you're also a scientist. Right. So, so yes, Abby. Um, yes, I am the host uh, for today, but I also work with fruit flies in the lab as a scientist. Yeah. And then awesome. to my right, we have... Hi, I'm um, Cassie Duran. I am a postdoctoral fellow and a bioengineer researcher. Um, I'm interested in, in stem cells in space and how regenerative mechanisms work. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Justine Richardson. I'm a senior research engineer. So I actually built system to recycle uh, air and water in space. Awesome. Wow. Very cool. Very and, cool you know, it's great to um, know you guys um, just a little bit, but we're actually going to try to get to know a little better. Um, so we're going to uh, start another segment called Weird Science. Weird Science. All right, so weird science. Um, I wanted to ask you guys, and also I will answer this myself. Yes. Uh, what is the strangest thing you've done in the name of science? And so while you guys think about it, I will start off with mine. And so my uh, weirdest thing I've ever done with science is actually um, in college, I um, ran a catering company with three other friends. And uh, we catered for weddings, for school events, for family parties, and things like that. But um, uh, so we were able to cook for, oh, 300, 400 people at a time, um, and that was a lot of fun. But when I started working at NASA, um, boy, I did not think I would actually be catering for flies. Yeah. So I actually make uh, fly food every single week, um, up to their specs, of course. I don't discriminate against clients, uh -huh. um, and I make food for them so that they can um, survive and they can grow. How weird. Mm. What, what is it? What's the food you're mixing? Oh, yeah. The food I make um, is made up of some grains. Um, there's also yeast, a um, lot of sugar. They love their sugar. Uh. And then we also put a coagulating agent, so it turns kind of like a jello, almost. <laughs> Fly Jello. Fly Jello. Christina Chung, Fly Jello caterer. It's great on my yeah. resume. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Excellent. Pretty weird. Yeah, pretty weird. A little weird, yeah. <laughs> just, a, just a little bit. <laughs> so I don't have any weird science like that, but I have a weirdly dedicated to science kind of story. Um, when I was also in graduate school, uh, I was working on a personalized medicine project with um, with uh, the guy who was sponsoring my, my PhD, and we were trying to replicate um, uh, skeletal joints so that we could create an implant that was specialized for each individual patient. Oh, like custom fit? Exactly. <laughs> custom custom fit. Fit. <laughs> so for this particular project, uh, we had done a, uh, a three-dimensional x-ray, or a uh, x-ray computed, computed uh, com I can't see, speak today. No and uh, 3D CT or computed tomography. Oh, okay. You know, I'd get it eventually. CT scan. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Medical situation. And uh, what I needed to do to complete the implant was to 3D print um, cool. uh, these skeletal structures so I could fit the implant perfectly. And I needed a specific kind of printer and a specific kind of, of material. And after a lot of searching, I found a print shop that could do it. And they told me it would take about 16 hours to print. And the guy who was normally the tech for printing was not going to be there until two days later. It would happen uh -oh. like that. Exactly. <laughs> how it happens. Works. I'm like, oh boy. So I literally said, well, I know how to use this printer. Can I stay here overnight? Oh, and wow. can I be the one who prints this? Oh, and really? so I stayed for 16 hours and I made sure the machine didn't break so that we had the printed model ready and we could fit the implants perfectly. So wow. if, if I'm able to ask, what? did you print? What skeletal <laughs> model did oh, you yeah. print? So for this specific project, we were looking at uh, the jaw, or uh, this specific section here. Ooh. It's called the temporomandibular joint. Uh, when it goes bad, it goes really bad really quickly. Oh. And we were creating a, a tissue-engineered implant to basically correct that problem. Ah. Wow. And, and then was the patient all right? So like, I wasn't the doctor, but oh, from okay. everything I know, it went really, really well. Oh, yes. well, that's... Wow. Your dedication paid off. Your sleepover at, at the coffee shop <laughs> paid off. 
<laughs> Excellent. Weird dedication. Weird catering. Mm-hmm. What about you, Justine? Can you chop that? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> well, I can describe some of the interesting experience I have. Oh, yes. <laughs> so when I first actually first got to AIM, one of my first job was to develop a wastewater recycling system. Uh -oh. uh, by <laughs> right. Wastewater. 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 Actually to else. portable water. <laughs> I see where and so when going. it was time to test the system, yes, how I needed a 55 gallon barrel of urine oh. and dirty shower water. Boy, oh boy. That's a lot of gallons. That's uh, yes. what I make for my flies. I'll give you that. Get that. <laughs> yeah, good well, question. You know, we have a five gallon glass bottle in the men's bathroom. So uh, very realistic with is a what you're funnel telling me. on top. Oh, oh and they contribute. <laughs> and for the female, <laughs> yes. That's such a great For the female, you know what? I had to go around with a bottle. An example, and say, can you, can, can I have your urine, please? What a great conversation I mean, starter. It's a, it's a huge <laughs> contribution to science, oh, right? Oh, You're yes. going to be in the history book forever. It's a NASA document. Wow. And so that's how we got it. And we, we did that for weeks to try to mix this, you know, mixture of urine. Um, I had a fully gown. Wow. Yeah. And then you used it on your system? Yes, we did. Yes, how to go? Uh, actually, we did. Uh, Go all the way to portable water. Wow! Wow! Yeah, so you, that, that you means drink you can drink that stuff, it. right? We okay. didn't drink it. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> but you could have drank it. I could have drank it. Yes. Yeah. There's yeah. an important distinction no. between the two. I'm just gonna say that right now. Yeah. That's pretty impressive, though. Yeah, that's that was uh, not my preferred job. <laughs> right. But I always say, like, for the science. Yeah. All right. Yeah, in the name of science. You got to do some yes. weird things to yes. get the NASA job done. I guess. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that is completely weird, Justine. But <laughs> it's very interesting. Yes. But. I guess what's not weird is using everyday items to get your research done, because that's what you guys are going to show us in the next section, right? So we're going to move on now to present to you some of our genius space hacks. So as I was describing before, these guys sometimes encounter challenges in the lab, and they need quick fixes or they need smart fixes, and you don't necessarily need some super fancy equipment to do it. You can invent something with a little creativity. So Christina, let's start with you and your flies. This first hack we're calling Lord of the Fly Sorters. You are a fly sorter extraordinaire. <laughs> How many do you think you've sorted over the years? Well, Abby, that is extremely flattering uh, well. title, um, Lord of the Fly Sorters. Uh, yes, I have um, sorted many flies in my lifetime. I would say tens of thousands at least. Good Lord. Um, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a lot to think about. It's a lot of hours, but um, yes. Why are you sorting flies? Tell us where this all begins. Well, that's a great question. So why do I sort flies? Actually, believe it or not, flies are actually... Um, they're different. They're not all the same. Um, they might all look the same, you know, with, to the naked eye, but they're actually a little bit different. And uh, we do this so that we want to make sure that uh, we know for um, our experiments, um, you know, what fly goes where, essentially. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And so um, one of the most common... Um, I can see them actually. See I just them? realized in the close-up, I see them. Yeah, they're all they're all happy up around. there, scurrying around at top. Okay. Um, so actually, uh, one common um, way that we sort is actually between males and females, mm -hmm. um, and so they are distinctively different, and uh, we're able to see that under a microscope. And so normally, uh, what we do in the lab is that we actually take flies that are in a vial like this, and we'll have a tray kind of out. Um, about this big, about a cell phone size tray or so. Okay. And then we'll actually dump out the flies and they'll form a little pile. And unfortunately, we can't just tell the flies. Like, um, <laughs> guys on this side, girls on this side, right. you know, and just have them all lined up. Um, unfortunately, we can't even get humans to do that. So yeah. it's not going to happen for flies. Um, so, you know, how do we do that? Well, actually, uh -huh. what we do is we use. There it is. Oh, yep. And oh. she's actually there a using the hack. I don't know if you can actually see it on there, but she's actually using the hack. A and you can see. A paintbrush. Yep, a paintbrush. <laughs> and you can see on the left is actually uh, females, I believe. And on the right, Right is um, males. Wow, you can tell just by yeah, I can it. tell. Uh, it's, a, it's a seasoned eye. They can tell. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. But you learn after about a couple thousand flies. You'll, you'll oh, start shot. learning. <laughs> Again, is that learning. all it takes? It, that's all it takes. A couple uh, thousand flies here or there. Okay, so you just need an ordinary watercolor type paintbrush yes. to sort flies for space station experiments, basically. Yes, exactly. And this is my favorite paintbrush. Um, it is um, not only because it's a beautiful color, it's pink <laughs> and magenta color, um, but also it has actually very um, 
sturdy bristles, um, <laughs> but actually still very soft. So what we can do is actually pick up individual flies. Oh, wow. And um, place them where we want to, where we want them to go. And we're also able to do like a sweeping motion to kind of move <laughs> the flies into different piles. Wow, genius! Amazing. You don't yep. need some specialized fly sorting device. Nope. We just need to go to a craft brush. store or yeah. a watercolor set if you take it from a watercolor palette, <laughs> and you can use that for yeah. this. Awesome. So Digital D has a question for you. Oh yes. Have the flies ever escaped? <laughs> oh. Yes. <laughs> if I'm going to be honest, then yes, um, they have escaped. Um, but mostly that's a user error, more, yeah. more so than the flies. Um, but what we do is we just were able to either um, kind of catch them and scoop them back up, uh -huh. or sometimes we just let them go. <laughs> Farewell. Farewell, <laughs> flies. I'm sorry you can't join us in our experiment. Right. But yeah. All right. So those are the experiments that Sharmila was talking about a little yes, while ago. Yes. So um, I actually work in her lab. Oh, yeah. um, so she is someone I'm very close to, and uh, we sort flies all the time. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. Now, as weird as that is, I just want to mention that someone has voted in Justine as the winner. Oh, of the yes. Yes. I, I well, agree completely. With I that. Was, I would you like to that. volunteer? <laughs> she, she can definitely take I'm that. Looking. I'm Ari. <laughs> now, as we move on to our second ha hack, a little shout out to I am Lungand, who mentions I put fruit flies to sleep with sleeping gas in biology class. Stay tuned. Here comes hack number two, which we are calling Nighty Night Flies. Now, that's not a nursery rhyme that you missed in your youth. <laughs> that is about a way to make flies fall asleep fast, right, Christina? Yes, that's so, definitely very true. So tell us, how does that normally work in the lab, and then what's your hack all about? Yeah, so normally in the lab, actually what we do is we have a um, big carbon dioxide tank. Um, if we want, we can queue up the photo. Yeah, there's um, a photo of you next to it, I think. So why carbon dioxide? Because that's going to well, knock nope, out your flies. The next, oh, there, there we, we go. go. Um, so carbon dioxide will actually um, put the flies to sleep. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, I literally mean put the flies to sleep, <laughs> not put the flies to sleep. So well, they wake yeah. up. They, yeah, they, 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 can, they can wake they up. Can yes, wake up. And, we, okay. and most of the time, we, we want them to wake back up. That's right. actually the yeah, goal yeah, yeah. of this. It's, it's supposed it's to be a temporary thing. <laughs> okay. And so what we do is, um, so we actually have to do this um, normally. This is how we're able to um, maneuver the flies uh, with carbon dioxide when they fall asleep. Okay. And so, um, so yeah, that's why we have to use carbon dioxide. All right, but you were telling me then, okay, so the fly experiments go to the space station. Right. They spend perhaps a month there, right? Yep. And then some of the flies come back for you to study changes in them. Right. On the ground, right? Yes. And then is that when you're going to need a hack? Because you have to go fetch them. Yes. So actually what we do is we actually have to go to Long Beach, California, okay. which is um, down the coast of California. Since we're up in north, it's actually down further south. And so we can't um, just, you know, strap a tank to our car and expect to drive down with it. Um, you don't want to go down, down the highway with the 80 pound tank on the roof? No, and with those no. potholes in California, for all of our Californians, we all know this. Uh, yeah, that's just not going to fly. <laughs> fly. Fly count pun number one. Um, so, no, um, we, we're not going to be able to do that. And so, um, what the genius scientist at NASA Ames Research Center did was actually found a way to create portable carbon dioxide. Okay. Yep. How do you do that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So actually what we did was we have a um, bottle, and this is a fly bottle that we um, have in the lab all the time. And we hold uh, flies in it, kind of like this vial, uh, just bigger, and so we can hold more flies. And so what we did was we took a spare one, and we filled it up with tap water, um, just water you can find in the sink. And then what we did was we actually were able to hack this by... What is that? Dropping two antacid tablets. Huh. And antacid. so, yeah, antacid tablets. So this is actually, antacid tablets are used for indigestion. Mm -hmm. um, those are the ones you can find at your local drugstore. Um, really? These, uh, yep, these are just the same ones. These are these two tablets. And so to demonstrate this hack, uh, we're actually going to be able to um, show you how the flies fall asleep. Uh, but what I also wanted to make sure was that safety first. Oh, um, yes. Oh, so yes. we all have, have, right. have, have, oh, have go. goggles. All right, goggle up. Goggle up. <sighs> now we're geeky. Science yes, to do there's here. nothing wrong with looking geeky. <laughs> um, NASA is very concerned about everybody's safety. Always. <laughs> Always, including on set. And so what we did 
was that we have you know, a bottle of water, and then now we have a uh, vial of flies. And so I'm going to drop these two tablets, and then can I get a quick countdown from the folks here? <laughs> Three, Three, two, two one. one. There we go. And you can see oh, it's yeah, actually see fizzing, right? Yeah, I yeah. see a lot of bubbles. And so what we do is now we have to stop it with a rubber stopper, and now we're actually able to um, direct the carbon dioxide out the needle, and what we can do is take the vial, you can see they're all crawling up there, getting all excited, and what we'll uh, do is we'll kind of insert it in, and we'll wait for the carbon dioxide to um, affect them, and as you can see... Yeah, they're starting to drop. They're starting to drop. <laughs> That's pretty quick. They're dropping like flies. Oh, here, oh number sorry, two. we're the pun no. number two. Wow. I'm like sorry, flies. I can't help myself. So as you can see now, they're all asleep at the bottom. You can see them right yeah, there. there. fast. And so, yeah, now we have about, oh, 30 seconds or so to be oh, able wow. to... Um, sort the flies, um, much like we did before at the hack. We, we bring our trusty little paintbrush and separate the flies into their appropriate yeah. containers. Wow, that's not a lot of time, though. No, no, we have some trained hands in the team yeah. that we can work really fast and very carefully, but accurately as yeah. well. Yeah, interesting. And while we're talking about working with flies and other organisms and putting them to sleep, letting them wake up, what can you guys tell us about the, the precautions you take to treat animals? correctly and humanely right there are, there are rules around that right in your work that oh yeah definitely and I know you know I speak for myself in my own research um, but I know um, these folks especially Cassie here um, also is very uh, familiar with this as well um, but yes we take the utmost precaution um, and utmost um, to sensitivity to yeah. the animals and knowing that you know they are giving their lives for us to be able to learn more um, in science and, and they live good lives. Right? Yes, they, they get to lay around. They eat a lot. They chill out all day in a nice warm room. You know, they're right, perfectly they're happy. Catered, catered food. Yes, catered food. Yes, <laughs> oh, I know all about that. And so uh, we take um, here at NASA, especially you know, we take very much care into that mm -hmm. and making sure that we um, don't do things just for fun. You know, we do it course, for right. the advancement of science and yeah. to help and. Uh, help us as humans as well. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you for that. Of course. Really neat. Right. Fascinating. Yeah. So <laughs> I hope that the the viewer who has done that before got a kick out of seeing a NASA scientist putting flies to sleep, <laughs> probably in a similar way. Uh, let's move on, though, to our next hack, which Cassie is going to walk us through. So this is about sending spacecraft into space, such as satellites, and before NASA launches anything, it sends it up there for, for good to run an experiment, they're going to test it very carefully and give it a sort of spacecraft checkup, which is the name of this next hack. Cassie, can you tell us What's the, what's the deal and sure. how do you uh, I can go into this a little. So yeah. when we package our experiments for flight, they're usually contained in these nice sturdy boxes mm -hmm. so that if anybody like drops it or if it needs to get like on the space station, there's no gravity. So we orient them upside down. Sometimes they're attached to the walls. Sometimes they're in the floors. They kind of go all over. Okay. So we pack them up in these nice sturdy containers. But once they're packed in here, we can't really check on them to make sure that everything inside is still working. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how do we do a go, no, go, basically, uh, for, for flight on an experiment? So like, like how this? do you decide this is yeah. good, good to go, it's working correctly, yeah, or Yeah, because, stop, of course, not, at NASA, everything yeah. has like a backup and then a backup to the backup. Okay. So yeah, we right. want to make sure that we're sending up a working model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we actually put things together, we uh, do a last minute checkup, and checkup is an accurate word because we use a trusty stethoscope. Oh, oh, I've uh, seen those before. Uh, yep, there you go. Anybody who's ever been to a doctor has seen one of these yeah. before. So literally, if I plug these into my ears, I can take my stethoscope and I can listen for moving parts within you know, this system. Sometimes it's a pump, sometimes it's check valves, sometimes it's gas going through the system. Oh wow, you can hear and all And I can hear all of that. By moving around my stethoscope to make sure everything's in working order. Awesome. So, yeah. what are you listening? Like, what kind of sound are we listening for? Like, do you can you? Yeah. A so, bit? like a valve will be a click click. Like oh, okay. A, hmm. Oh, yeah. so, okay. Literally, as the valve opens, you'll hear it open. As it closes, if there's any gases running, for example, you'll hear a hissing noise, just okay. like we kind of heard a little bit when your CO2 right, with was going into the flies. With carbon dioxide. Yep. Exactly. So I'm gonna. That's so cool. Like, why reinvent the wheel or exactly. the stethoscope? Right. It's already going. When that, that thing already exists to do what you need so to Cassie, do. So, Cassie, can we awesome. call you a space doctor? Please don't. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that, that would 
that would be too cool. I'm oh. not quite there yet. <laughs> not that cool. All right, let's move on right. to our next hack, which you're also going to show us. So we'll give you a moment to get it up here. But I think you're going to tell us about spinning for science and space. So we're going to call this hack spin class. <laughs> so. This is about using a centrifuge, right? So I, I worked in a lab briefly. I remember what that is. Can you run us through, though, what a centrifuge is, how that works? Sure, absolutely. So a, one of the major things we have to do in research is we have to be able to separate our samples. Just like Christina uses her paintbrush to separate flies, we have to separate cells from culture media, from other like water components and things like that. Yeah, okay. And the way we do that is on Earth, You know, for example, if you wanted to pour a glass of water, gravity kind of does the work for you. You right. pour the glass of water and you're fine. In space, however, because there's no gravity, we have to use other forces to drive fluids in certain directions. And one of the main ones we use is a centrifuge. Centrifuge is basically a rotary device that spins mm -hmm. and creates a, a load or a force in a single direction. And with that single direction force, you're able to separate liquids based on densities or masses uh, or move fluids from one position to another. OK. Oh. So yeah. on, on that note, no. <laughs> I think I know what that's all about. I happen to have brought my salad spinner <laughs> oh with me boy, today. I am so hungry. This is what we're talking about. I've got my wet lettuce, throw it in here, right? And then I'm going to get this spinning. Right. More or less, that is exactly what we're talking <laughs> about. And it's going to kind of throw the water against the wall, and then it's going to drain out the bottom, and my lettuce is dry. Is that, Perfect. Is exactly. that the same idea? It's the same idea. The difference is. If I'm separating out microscopic cells, I need something a little bit more powerful than your arm. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Fine. You look strong, but <laughs> fine. Whatever. <laughs> Although we could use right. salad. We could use salad. Yeah. Is there anything in there? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm having to chow down. Maybe. Um, so, so all right. So yeah. So something a little more powerful than this. Exactly. But a lab centrifuge is a big thing, right? You brought yeah. a picture. We actually do have a photo, yes. so you can pull that up. Um, Oh wow! All right, so it's a it's a big machine. That's yes. not a thing that you can easily launch the space station. No, definitely not. Um, this this thing would take up way too much mass and way too much space. It's <laughs> it's a big machine. Um, so basically, we needed a version of that that we could then use in space that wouldn't take up really any excess space. Okay. And that's our second hack. All right, our third hack. Ooh, I guess. Bring it out. So it out. how do we do that? We use. Dun, dun, dun. A drill. <laughs> oh my god. A power goodness. drill. A power drill. This is a very traditional, like the astronauts will use, uh, they have a couple of versions of this on station, but uh, they'll use it for repairs, they'll use it for uh, repositioning of, of gear on mm -hmm. station, and we decided that we would use it as our makeshift centrifuge. All right, cool. And the way we do that is we have a drill, and we used a 3D printer, and we printed one of these. This is basically a uh, centrifuge rotor. And what this does, get a zoom in on that, uh, what this does is it has several positions along the rim where we can put sample tubes. And I have an example of a sample tube that's out right now. So this Ooh. is a sample tube. That looks kind of interesting. And our sample tube Me. fits right into this rotor. So if I pop it open a little bit, All right. bring it closer so I can see what I'm doing. So if I open the lock, I can pop the tube right in. If I lock the tube back in, I can then mount this whole thing. Let's see if I can do that. Yep, I can successfully. And then this, if I had my sample in, I can literally run this. And I would like to run it, but safety first. Uh, oh, 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 my gosh. Oh, oh. Bum, no, bum. We're going to need another. Oh, okay. You guys are better than me. I forget every time. <laughs> <laughs> That's because we work in a lot. <laughs> we, we can't forget. They oh, don't let so us run right. it. If I have my centrifuge, this will spin nicely. I'm going to spin it slowly because we're in a studio. Right. But yeah, uh, and basically cool. after this is finished spinning, I have a photo of what happens with some dyed liquid. Ooh. And what you can see here, if we can see, there we go. Uh, we have two pictures. This picture over here is before the sample is centrifuged. So you can see that all the sample is in the loading input well. And then after centrifuge, the sample has moved down and is now in the test window. Cool. So now from this state, we could do whatever kinds of tests we're actually right. looking to do. Let's see that video of astronaut Kate oh, Rubens yeah, using absolutely. this hack on the space station. All right, so she's... There she is. That's exactly the same oh, thing you just yeah, showed us. Exactly the same thing. Same drill, even. All right. And she's having just as much trouble. <laughs> And oh, there she, it goes. She's spinning. And she's spinning it at full speed. Cool. Wow, that's pretty neat. Awesome. 
I love that that's actually in use up there. Yep, that is in so cool. use. And she's oh, out she's there. Really happy. She's yeah. out working. Okay. The kids up there are happy. <laughs> well, we've got to keep moving because we honestly have like four minutes left. <laughs> oh, so we have to say goodbye. So we want to hear about Justine's hacks. Um, so this next one we're going to call Take My Astronaut Breath Away because Justine works on keeping air clean for astronauts on the space station. And I know that you've helped design some systems that are already in use up there and that you have some new research going on that you can tell us about. Can you tell us the basics? What's the deal? We have to clean up the air that they've exhaled, the astronauts? Right. It's So uh, we take all the information that uh, you guys are doing and learn from it. And um, on the space station, as the astronaut breathe out oxygen, breathe in oxygen, they actually breathe out carbon dioxide. We need to reduce that carbon dioxide mm -hmm. in a room like this uh, to a level that's reasonable. Uh, so one way we do that is we use a material called solid sorbents. Solid now, sorbents, yeah, like so absorbent. Absorbents. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you take a look at these uh, sponge, you put this in water, water is absorbed, and you squeeze it out using pressure, or if you put it in the sun, the water comes back out. Another example of solid sorbent is like that a silica gel oh, wow. bag. Where do you find those? Oh, I've seen these in new shoe boxes, definitely. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 Yep. Beef jerky. <laughs> beef jerky. Uh, there you, go. you can eat your beef jerky, but do not, do not eat, eat the silica gel. The silica gel bag, right. So uh, we use a material that removes carbon dioxide. Uh, just like your water filter at home, remove contaminant from your water. Uh, so in order to remove the carbon dioxide, we have to first remove the water. So we use a similar uh, experiment, uh, a material, which is silica gel okay. on top. So the same stuff in that packet is yes. in this? Not same, but similar. Okay, okay. in okay. this right. space station and air then, recycling. Right, you thing. flow air through. Is it the space station, the system is bigger, it's like two five-gallon barrel. And then the air stream is dry. When it's dry, then we remove the carbon dioxide. And wow. the carbon dioxide is removed by these dry parts. Yes, the by the second sorbent that Very removed. Cool. And is this reusable too? Yeah. That is reusable because, you know, you put this in the sun, the water evaporate, you heat that up, the CO2 then comes off and it gets recycled and converted to uh, methane and water. So we waste awesome. nothing on station. No, yeah, we, really? everything is reusable, regenerable, uh, but it has to be safe material, right? Mm -hmm. You can't use a lot of chemicals. All right. So what's some of the, you know, uh, current research that's being done? On so some of the more advanced research as we travel a little bit further from uh, ISS or International Space Station, uh, we look at some other sorbents that are more effective that they use in the submarines sometimes. Ah, cool. Uh, and, uh, so these and are called, right, these are called liquid sorbents. Liquid sorbents, right. that's cool. So an example of this is uh, the material on top right there is a sor liquid sorbent that absorbs CO2 mm -hmm. when it's mixed in water. And when you add CO2 to it, it actually becomes one phase. That's cool. So this looks like oil and water, or like salad dressing. Right, right. Salad, 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 salad. Yeah. Right. Yes. Then it absorbs CO2 and it becomes mixable. One mixable. And yeah. then you heat it up and it will reverse right back. So cool. So it's regenerative yeah. as well. It's regenerative, it's regenerative and, and reusable. That is cool. the key word. Right. That's Incredible. Yeah, I'm really. impressed. You guys, <laughs> so clever. And I am so sad to say that we have to say goodbye. Ah, the, oh. These conversations go so fast every time. But thank you, all of you, for joining us. And thank you, everybody, for watching. This has been NASA in Silicon Valley Live. As we said, we are a conversational show about all the cool work going on at NASA's Ames Research Center. So tune in next time. We will be back on September 27th to talk about video games in space. So wow. join us then. You can watch us on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and NASA TV, and you can catch the audio version on our podcast. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and thank you guys for joining us. Of course. Bye. Bye.